Well, welcome. Welcome to the, uh, I think it's our, uh, our one History and Forms of Lyric lecture for this winter. We'll have a couple of events in the spring, but I'm delighted to uh, have Henry Wanfield as our uh, lecturer today. Um, uh, many of you probably don't know and might be surprised to find that Henry and I are actually brothers. Uh, not biologically, but um, we both had uh, one of the great formative experiences of our lives was going to City College of New York uh, in the late 60s uh, and uh, editing the college literary magazine uh, that came out of City College, which was one of the great magazines of all time. So Henry has, um, has many accomplishments, uh, some of which I will tell you about. But as far as I'm concerned, uh, editing Promethean is uh, way at the, uh, at the top of the list. But now I'll go and, and tell you the things that might mean more to you. Um, Henry is, um, did his uh, PhD at the uh, Graduate Center uh, of the City University um, and um, has been uh, teaching at Notre Dame since 91. Is that, is that right? Uh, and is now uh, a professor and the chair of the program in the liberal studies. No longer chair. No longer chair, okay. Okay, is now simply a professor in the program of liberal studies uh, and the English department at Notre Dame. And the, um, I had the pleasure of being, being at Notre Dame a few weeks ago, well no, I guess a little more, a few months ago. And um, this program in liberal studies is really an extraordinary, uh, serious, uh, great books program, and Henry has been crucial to it. Uh, and he, uh, I'm happy to say, won an award in teaching for his efforts at, at Notre Dame. Now, Henry has a number of identities, uh, so if this were a different kind of occasion, I'd be talking about Henry's poetry. Henry has published a number of volumes of poems and a number of poems, period. But uh, given uh, that um, this is a history and forms of lyric lecture, I'm going to tell you more about Henry as a critic and translator. Uh, so he has distinction in all of these, uh, these different uh, areas. So um, I'm sure many of you know his uh, remarkable and wonderful uh, Mallarmé translations, and I think that will come into the talk today uh, a bit. Uh, he's also, um, with uh, another person, translated um, some of uh, Hesiod. Did, uh, Glenn, did you know this? That Henry had a, uh, yes, so I was, I was surprised to discover this myself. Uh, and uh, is working, as you'll hear today, on uh, Ronsard. Uh, but he's also um, done some very important um, critical work. Uh, his dissertation on Gray turned into a book called The Poet Without a Name, Gray's Elegy and the Problem of History which uh, came out in 91. Uh, and then um, he's been quite productive in the last uh, few years, uh, a book uh, on George Oppen and William Bronck, on whom he is, uh, these are poets on whom he is one of the world's experts, called The Music of Thought in the Poetry of Oppen and Bronck uh, in 2009. And then uh, very recently, in a book that we'll be reviewing in Modern Philology, called The Blank Verse Tradition from Milton to Stevens, Free thinking and the crisis of modernity. And so this gives you some sense of, of Henry's range. So here's someone who translates Ronsard, translates Mallarmé, is an expert on Oppen and uh, Bronck and other objectivist poets, also writes about Milton, also writes about Wordsworth, also writes about Gray. So this just gives you a sense that this is simply a, um, a serious student of poetry, of the whole history of. Uh, of Western poetry in English, French, and um, other uh, languages. Um, aside from that, he also has some other editorial labors, aside from his great distinction as the uh, editor, the poetry editor of Promethean. Uh, he's also been on the editorial board of Sagatry, and edited a number of uh, special issues uh, for them, and is on the editorial board of the, of the Notre Dame Review.
So it's, it's just a delight for me to, um, to present uh, Henry to you, and I can hardly wait to hear about this lecture on hyperbole. Uh, I've tried to um, give some uh, examples of the same in my uh, introduction. So, um, but this is uh, a lecture that you'll see the, the range of Henry's interests, not just uh, the poets mentioned in the title, hyperbole and the possibility of lyric, Mallarmé and Ronsard, but I gather there are going to be some remarks about the contemporary scene of poetry as well. So it gives me great delight to introduce my brother, Henry Weinfield. Thanks so much, Richard, and, and we're so happy that Richard has recovered. I, I'm sure many of you know that he, he was very seriously ill recently, so it's, and I haven't seen him for a couple of months, so it's so nice to see him on the mend, and thank you all for coming, and uh, I don't know, is Anne Janusz here? She, she organized all of this, so I wanted to thank her as well. The talk is entitled Hyperbole and the Possibility of Lyric, Mallarmé and Ronsard. And I think I'm going to dedicate it to the memory of my mother, who was the world's greatest exaggerator. So, <laughs> <laughs> so OK. And you have a handout which has some of the examples that I'm going, to, I'm going to recite. Hyperbole, can you not rise in triumph from my memory, a modern magic spell devise as from an iron-bound grammary. So begins Mallarmé's poem, Prose pour des Essentes, 1885, des Essentes being the fictional protagonist of J.K. Huisman's novel of 1884, Arubur, usually translated as Against the Grain. Um, Prose, Mallarmé's Ars Poetica, is at once a lyric poem, indeed in some ways the quintessential modern lyric poem, and an allegory of how the coming into being of lyric poetry involves the transcendence of the ordinary, prosaic world that militates against the possibility of poetry. Prose begins with an apostrophe to hyperbole, a term from the Greek that means to throw beyond or above the mark, because for Mallarmé, as the poem's opening lines indicate, hyperbole is the modern equivalent of magic in a world in which we no longer believe in magic. Thus, from the outset, Mallarmé's prose calls attention to our embarrassment in the face of poetry, an embarrassment forced upon us by the prosaic world. The term prose in Mallarmé's title is ambiguous. It has our ordinary English meaning, but it also refers to a hymn that is sung during the Mass. A prosa is a Latin hymn, such as the Dies Irae, which is sung between the gradual and the reading of the Gospels. Mallarmé's prose, while registering irony and the crisis of modernity, or what in the title of his greatest essay, Crise de Verre, he, uh, he would view as the crisis of poetry or crisis of verse, is at the same time a secular hymn to beauty. As Georges Poulet notes, Mallarmé's po purpose in the poem is, quote, to create something equivalent to the ancient religious hymn, tantamount to what Mallarmé calls elsewhere liturgical remembrances in his essay, Catholisme. Like the medieval prosa, Mallarmé's poem will be an incantation directed toward a transcendence. That's from Poulet's book, The Metamorphoses of the, the Circle. The story that Mallarmé's prose tells is of a brother and sister, the former partly representing the rational part of the soul and the latter its sentient component, who journey to an unnamed island, a paradise of pure imminence in which beauty no longer needs to be envisioned because it is simply seen. Yes, on an isle the air had charged, not with visions but with sight, 
the flowers displayed themselves, themselves enlarged without our, our ever mentioning it. The problem, however, is that the flowers that the sister perceives are too large and too finely delineated to be contained by reason. And as a result, the inhabitants of the mainland, or in other words, the prosaic world, claim that this country never existed. Reason is impotent and, and sentience inarticulate, so it falls to poetry to bridge the gap between the two and preserve an experience that otherwise would be lost. But that sister, wise and tender, went no further than to smile, and that I might comprehend her, I cultivate my ancient skill. In the concluding quatrains of the poem, Mallarmé pays tribute to the dedicated poet who, sacrificing immediacy, resurrects a beauty that would otherwise be lost in death. The name Anastasius here is derived from the Byzantine Greek word for resurrection, and Pulcheria is the beauty that would be shrouded in death. Her ancestor, were, were she not, pre, uh, that is, would be shrouded in death, her ancestor, were she not preserved in poetry. And these are the last two uh, stanzas of, uh, of the poem in my translation. Or the last, uh, yeah. The, the child resigns her ecstasy, already mastering the steps. And Anastasia, says she, born for eternal manuscripts. Lest at a tomb her ancestor in any clime should laugh to bear this sacred word, Pulcheria, hidden by the too large lily flower. Just as the term prose is, as, is ambiguous in Mallarmé's poem, so too his concern with hyperbole is deeply ambivalent. On the one hand, as we have seen, hyperbole is the modern poetic equivalent of magic and thus a vehicle of transcendence. But on the other, from the standpoint of the prosaic world, it throws beyond the mark. It is over the top, as we would now say. It goes beyond our ordinary conceptions of the real. Mallarmé's prose provides me with my theoretical or allegorical frame, but my focus in this talk will be more fully on the sonnets, which I'm currently translating, of Pierre de Ronsard, 1524 to 1585, the leader of the Pléiade movement in France and specifically Ronsard's use of hyperbole in Les Amours de Cassandre, his first book of love poems, 1552. From Ronsard, I will turn to some observations on the theory of lyric before coming back to Mallarmé. I recognize that I'm trying to encompass much too much in this talk and that I have been thoroughly infected by my theme, so I ask your indulgence. Christopher Johnson, the author of Hyperbole, The Rhetoric of Excess in Baroque Literature and Thought, which came out in 2010, follows Harold Bloom in arguing that hyperbole is, quote, a master trope, one that vies with metaphor, metonymy, synecdoche, and irony for our attention, unquote. One of the questions I want to ask is whether hyperbole is merely a trope that can be empirically isolated or whether it is not also in lyric poetry such as Ronsard's, a condition of what I am calling the poetic, which is realized through poetic forms such as the sonnet. Ronsard's sonnets confirm Mallarmé's insight that hyperbole is at the essence of the lyric as a genre, but they also demonstrate that hyperbole is implicated in cultural patterns that we have come to identify with the Renaissance. In sonnet 36 of Les Amours de Cassandre, I'm using the standard Pléiade edition ordering, what we might call Ronsard's strategy, conscious or unconscious, for the sequence as a whole comes to the fore. And this, you have this on your, your handout. In the same way, Phoebus, you used to bewail the sadness that love now decrees that I feel, when lovesick and banished, you sang on the shores of the Zansus, fair river near Ilion's towers. 
Plucking your blandishing lyre in vain, Streams, flowers, and woods you enchanted again and again, but the beauty that made your soul wounded was not moved at all by the music you sounded. There from your pallor the flowers were made pale, there from your tears would the rivulet swell, there your vain hopes made you live in despair. Now love makes me grieve for the very same name near the town of Vendôme on the shores of the Loire, like a phoenix reborn from my sorrow's own flame. This sonnet reveals how the circumstances of Ronsard's life experience opened up a rich vein of mythology, which in turn released his creative capacities. The woman to whom the sonnet cycle is addressed was in fact named Cassandra, she was Cassandra Salviati, the 15-year-old daughter of an Italian banker whom Ronsard had happened to meet. And this accident has the effect of thrusting the poet into the story told by Ovid in the Metamorphoses of Apollo and Cassandra. In the Ovidian myth, Apollo gives Cassandra the gift of prophecy, but when she refuses his advances, ordains that her prophecies will never be believed. Ronsard, at least in this sonnet, is not interested in the details of the, the Ovidian story, however, but simply in the parallel that the story enables him to establish between Ap Apollo as an unrequited lover and his own situation. He establishes it through a single word, ainsi, in the same way in line two, Pour la douleur qu'amour veut que je, je sente, ainsi que moi, Phébus, tu l'homme en trois, which registers the hyperbolic connection with the God as a kind of leap of faith. Thus, just as Apollo sings on the shores of the Zansus near Troy, so Ronsard, the modern poet, sings on the shores of the Loire River near his native town of Vendôme. Vendôme was a rather undistinguished place in Ronsard's time, probably it still is, with no literary associations, and the Loire to which he refers was not the great river spelled with the final E that sweeps through the French wine country, but a minor tributary of the river Sartre. The sonnet purports to be about the grief Ronsard feels as a, res as a result of unrequited love, but it is really about an ability to compose poetry that he derives from the god and that in turn raises him up as a lyric poet. In the same way that you, now I, this is its structure. By establishing a parallel with Apollo, Ronsard is able to appropriate the glory associate, associated with the ancients in such a way as to transform his own prosaic reality into a poetic one. This gesture of appropriation, or we might figuratively say translation, is of course central to Renaissance classicism and was consciously adopted by the Pleiade. In a letter to Verlaine of 1885, Mallarmé speaks of the poet's, quote, sole duty and true function of literature as being quote, the Orphic understanding of the earth. And though Ronsard invokes Apollo in the sonnet, the conception of poetry that he advances is clearly an Orphic one. Orpheus, the archetypal poet, charmed the woods and streams, singing so beautifully that nature resonated to his song. In Ronsard's conception, there is a correspondence between Apollo's grief and the response of nature, there from your pallor, the flowers were made pale, etc. Although Apollo is represented as an unrequited lover, the Orphic conception that Ronsard develops underscores the poet's ambition to heal the division between man and nature, a, div a division that begins perhaps to be felt in the Renaissance and is certainly one of the hallmarks of modernity. Ronsard consciously uses the verb enchanted in line six, fleuve et fleur et bois, tu enchantois, streams, flowers, and woods you enchanted again and again, 
because it, begins, it, be, it brings together the ideas of music and magic, the poet's incantor, incantatory verse and its magical power to lift language beyond the prosaic immediacies of ordinary discourse. Here again, by imitating the god and by assuming the Orphic quest, Ronsard takes on the mantle of poetry and releases his own creative powers. Matthew Arnold, in his essay on Thomas Gray, wrote that great qu Gray, quote, fell upon an age of prose, unquote. Of course, the golden age is always of the past, and every age sees itself as a prosaic one, an age of prose. Ours certainly does, and undoubtedly is. It was perfectly natural for a Renaissance poet to invoke Apollo. This was an accepted convention and part of the rules of the game, so to speak. But for us, it would be impossible. The disenchantment of the world, in Mar Marcel Gaucher's phrase, as a result of which poetry has been divested of much of its traditional symbolism, has rendered such gestures meaningless. Ronsard's comparison of himself with Apollo is hyperbolic, but if you agree with me that this is a beautiful poem, and of course you're looking at it in my translation, then the sonnet is its own testament to the fact that in throwing beyond the mark, Ronsard manages to hit it too. This leads me to say something perhaps off topic about the importance of the translation process. Just as in writing the sonnet, Ronsard attempts to appropriate a mythical resonance, so in translating it, I am attempting to bring over into my own language, time, and idiom possibilities that would otherwise be unavailable to me. Like Ronsard's phoenix in the sonnet, and I realize that the analogy is a bit hyperbolic, Translation allows for a process of recovery that can eventually serve the interests of cultural renewal. Thus, it is vital to the process of handing down that goes by the name of tradition. Sonnet 44 from the Cassandra sequence offers another example in which hyperbole is implicated in Ronsard's mythical comparisons. You have that also, the uh, next one in the handout. I'd gladly be Ixion on his wheel or Tantalus in the waters down below if I could hold her naked and could know that beauty even the angels can't excel. No torment sent by fate if that were so. Even the rock I had to, to push uphill that always rolled back down would lay me low. Even the vulture making of me a meal. To touch her rounded breast or even see would lift me from a lover's destiny unto the majesty of kings of Asia. Her kiss would make a demigod of me, and skin to skin, my fire quenched, I'd be one of those deities that eat ambrosia. In the octave, Ronsard has fun running through the mythological figures that are punished in Hades. Ixion, Tantalus, and the unnamed Sisyphus and Prometheus. He announces with obvious hyperbolic glee that he would gladly suffer the eternal torments of all of these sufferers if only he could possess the beloved who rivals the angels and epitomizes all beauty. In, in the Sestet, the poet traces an erotic progression which, he tells us, if only it could be experienced in actuality, would have the effect of transforming his destiny from that of an unrequited lover to an Asian potentate, a demigod, and finally to an Olympian god. Virtually everything is hyperbolic in this sonnet. Hyperbole is less an actual trope that can be empirically isolated for analysis than a condition of the sonnet itself, a je ne sais quoi that in separating the poetic from the prosaic makes poetry possible. But to return to Ronsard and his erotic travails, he is clearly fixated on breasts, and in this, of course, he is not alone, but sometimes, as in the sestet of Sonnet 40 of the Cassandra sequence, 
They inspire hyperbolic flights of fancy that lead to destinations, physical and, un and metaphysical, that he himself could not have anticipated. If Europa's breast was quite this beautiful, you wisely took the semblance of a bull, good Jupiter, in traveling through the sea. Not solely for its grandeur is the sky deemed perfect, but, like this, for being round. In roundness is perfection to be found. Here again we have the implicit rivalry with the god, but in this case the beautiful roundness of a breast leads to a metaphysical proposition, i.e. that perfection, which from the Latin has the sense of completeness, consists in things that are round. Car le parfait consiste en choses rondes in the original. Sometimes indeed, as in sonnet 193, the poet's obsession with Cassandra's breasts is raised to mystical, indeed religious, proportions. The metaphorical descriptions contained in this poem are stunning, but what I find most remarkable are the assertions contained in the final tercet. You have this one on your handout. These two twin streams of clotted milk that flow over a valley white itself as snow, they are like tides approaching near the shore, which slowly ebb and slowly come back once more. A space between them forms as if between hills where a leveled pathway can be seen, white from the drifts of snow with which it's filled. In winter, when the wind drops, and is stilled. Two gleaming rubies there are raised on high. They lend their radiance to the ivory that smoothly curves around them on all sides. All honor there, and there all grace abides. And beauty, if the world has any, flies to the abode of this fair paradise. I've done my best with the English, but nothing can match the grace of Ronsard's cadences, his rhymes on a bond and moan, for example, which convey the idea that if there is any beauty in the world, it is localized in Cassandra's breasts, a somewhat melancholy assertion because it leaves open the possibility that there is no beauty in the world. La tout honneur, la toute grâce abonde, et la beauté, Si quelqu'une est au monde, vol au séjour de ce beau paradis. It would be irresponsible of me to leave the impression that Ronsard is inspired only by Cassandra's breasts. He is also inspired by other parts of her anatomy, <laughs> especially her eyes. In sonnet uh, 57, a poem that addresses Joachim du Ballet, Ronsard's friend and companion in the Pleiad, he speaks of being, quote, led by the beacon of his lady's eyes, and in 68, of having been utterly transformed by the lamp of those fair eyes. Interestingly, the latter sonnet concludes with an address to the beloved's eyes that alludes to the Aristotelian idea of entelecheia the, actua the actualization of a form-giving cause. So he says in that, uh, in that sonnet, O light containing fire divine that burns so ardently, giving me movement and my very being, are you not then my soul in teleki? I love that. I mean, that's, uh, what a nerve to use Aristotle's in teleki in that, in that way. Hyperbole here is an aspect of, or perhaps equivalent to, the sheer poetic play that allows Ronsard to make use of philosophical ideas, such as the Aristotelian entelechy, in ways that are at once whimsical and yet completely serious. In Sonnet 81, to take another example, Ronsard takes up a serious question of Renaissance science, whether a void or vacuum exists, or whether as Neoplatonism interpreted Plato in the Timaeus as asserting, there is a planum beyond the spheres. And you have that sonnet, um, first quatrain goes, 
Pardon me, Plato, if I can't assume that under the round vault of the gods, outside the world maybe, or in the deepest gloom that sticks and compasses, there's not some void. In the second quatrain, Ronsard reasons that if a plenum exists, it may have been caused by the tears he has wept because of Cassandra's mistreatment of him. If a plenum exists in that vault, does the flow come from the tears that pour from my eyes, as well as the sighs I sob to the skies when, when love slacks the reins that bridle my woe? Okay, enough examples. The question that confronts us with passages as hyperbolic as these is how the poet manages to get away with them. Or, to pose the paradox in another way, how can what is thrown beyond the mark manage nevertheless to hit the mark? The general answer has to do with the forms, conventions, and traditions of poetry that allow, allow it to separate itself, as it were, metaphysically from prose and the realm of the prosaic. But here we have to be careful not to fall into tautology. We can speak of Petrarchan conventions, for example, the lamp of those fair eyes is an obvious one, or of Neoplatonist conceptions that allow the light of a woman's eyes to be seen as representing and containing the light of divinity, but these are mere descriptions and as such do not tell us why in the context of poetry such as Ronsard's, they are not rejected out of hand either as cliches or for their absurdity. I think it is clear that the mediating formalisms of lyric poetry, meter, rhyme, and so on, somehow defend it against the incursions of the prosaic world, so that what would be regarded as ridiculous or inadmissible in ordinary discourse is not perceived as such in the context of the poem. But why should that be? Literary theory has struggled with this problem since at least the Renaissance. Responding to the not uncommon argument during the Renaissance that poetry is, quote, the mother of lies, Sir Philip Sidney, in his apology for poetry, famously argued that the poet, he nothing affirms, and therefore never lieth. Sidney's position seems rather tenuous. An affirmation is a positive assertion or declaration, and poems, Ronsardus, for instance, are as replete with assertions and declarations as any other kind of discourse. When Ronsard writes in the passage we quoted earlier, all honor there and there all grace abides, and beauty, if the world has any, flies to the abode of this fair paradise, these are certainly affirmations. Whatever he may have intended by them, and whatever their truth value might be. Of course, we know what Sidney means. It's not so much that the poet nothing affirmeth, as that his affirmations cannot be taken out of their poetic context. They have meaning only in those contexts. The new criticism attempted to deal with the general problem posed by the assertions or affirmations that occur in the context of lyric poetry by hypostatizing a fictional speaker as a mediating link between the poet and the utterances set forth in the poem. And oddly, despite the many ways in which the tenets of the new criticism have been, atta have been attacked in recent decades by critics of diverse and disparate persuasions, the notion of the speaker remains a shibboleth of American academic criticism. The reification of a speaker, which turns the lyric into a species of drama, implies that the poet in the act of composition first has to invent a persona who then speaks his lines. This seems to me a cumbersome Rube Goldberg device and a misguided approach to the lyric as a genre. Prior to the advent of the new criticism, do we ever find critics referring to a speaker when lyric poetry is concerned? As Kate Hamburger points out in The Logic of Literature, a German title is Die Logik der 
Dichtung, I think the logic of poetry would have been a better title, uh, translation. Quote, Aristotle drew the dividing line between mimetic and elegiac art where he separated poiein from legain. That is, where he separated making in the sense of creating fictions from speaking in the sense of making statements. For Hamburger, following Aristotle and Hegel, there is, quote, an intransgressible boundary which separates fictional, na narration, fictional narration from reality statement, and therefore from the statement system of language. And thus, in her view, however paradoxical this might seem, especially when one considers the present, perhaps centrality, of hyperbole in lyric poetry such as Ronsard's, the logic of lyric corresponds to reality statement rather than to fictional narration. The new criticism I think we can now see was part of a climate of critical opinion that turned poetry away from statement and assertion, especially of an abstract kind. Williams's apothem, no ideas but in things, and MacLeish's dictum, a poem should not mean but be, are part of the same climate of opinion. One that is profoundly bourgeois in my view in the sense of shrinking from anything radical in the way of philosophical statement and lyric poetry. A new critical reading of Ronsard's Cassandra sonnets might soften and mitigate the hyperbolic statements they contain by adducing a speaker who has been bewitched to the point of lunacy by his lady's charms. This would be precisely the wrong way to read Ronsard, in my opinion, not only because it would introduce a chimera, but because in doing so, it would have the effect of muffling Ronsard's poetry. But if the new critical idea of the speaker is designed to deflect the statements and affirmations contained in poems from their putative source in the subjectivity of actual individuals, individuals inhabiting an ordinary prosaic reality, then the question remains as to how the gap is bridged between this prosaic realm and the realm of poetry. Mallarmé, remain, Mallarmé remains our best guide to this dilemma in my view, but before examining what Mallarmé has to say, I want briefly to turn to Shelley. For Shelley, in The Defense of Poetry, 1821, that which bridges the gap between the prosaic and the poetic is inspiration, pure and simple. To bridge the gap between ordinary subjectivity and inspiration, that is, between the prosaic and the poetic, Shelley resorts to the old metaphor of divinization. Inspiration, he tells us, quote, is, as it were, the interpenetration of a diviner nature through our own, unquote. For Shelley, poetic inspiration precedes poetic composition, quote, the mind in creation is as a fading coal which some invisible influence, like an inconstant wind, awakens to transitory brightness, he tells us. And when composition begins, inspiration is already on the decline, and the most glorious poetry that has ever been communicated to the world is probably a feeble shadow of the original conception of the poet." Unquote. The visitations of the divinity in man do not last. They are evanescent, a word that Shelley repeats a number of times, because, quote, there is no portal of expression from the caverns of the spirit which they inhabit into the universe of things. It's probably the most difficult sentence in the whole of the defense. It's one I've meditated on uh, many a time. Although poetry, actual poetry that is composed and written down, quote, redeems from decay the visitations of the divinity of man, in Shelley's somewhat tragic conception, there is no co communication between the po poetic and the prosaic. Shelley is a great craftsman, in my opinion, one of the greatest among the English poets. But oddly, in the defense, he places very little emphasis on poetic craft as such. 
Indeed, although for Shelley, the distinction between the poetic and the prosaic, between states in which one is inspired and states in which one is not, is sharply edged, the distinction between poetry and prose is, quote, a vulgar error. Plato was essentially a poet, he asserts. Here, Mallarmé, though as it happens he was deeply influenced by Shelley, in a letter of 1865 he, he writes, I've had a copy of Shelley since my days at college and consider him one of the greatest poets I know. Here Mallarmé offens, offers an important counterexample and perhaps corrective. In Crise de Verre, the essay to which I referred earlier, Mallarmé writes, the pure work of poetry implies the disappearance of the poet as speaker who cedes the initiative to the words themselves. L'œuvre pure implique la disparition élocutoire du poète qui cède l'initiative au mot. I suspect that French theory, I'm thinking in particular of Barth, who wrote The Death of the Author, of course, Derrida and Foucault, has taken Mallarmé's statement farther than he intended and perhaps misread it. Mallarmé, at least in my view, is not referring to the disappearance of the author, but precisely of the speaker, that is, to ordinary subjectivity. The compositional process continues to be guided by the author, who else, but as it were from the outside. By ceding the initiative to the words, the poet enters into language in a way that releases his creative capacities. Inspiration is not prior to composition, as it is for Shelley, but is motivated and activated in the very meshes and gears of the compositional process. Je suis syntaxier, Mallarmé wrote. The poet is essentially one who struggles with syntax so that an innate meaning, which is never prior to this struggle, can emerge. The process is still intentional, in my opinion, but this intentionality is guided by the author, not by subjectivity in the ordinary sense, and is mediated by language in a profoundly material way. In the preface to Un Coup de Day, the radical experiment in spatial poetics that resulted in Mallarmé's appropriation by the avant-garde, the poet refers to, quote, the ancient technique of verse for which I retain a religious veneration. It follows that when Mallarmé speaks of seeding, seeding the initiative to the words themselves, he is thinking not just of words, but of forms, of rhyme and meter, and the other mediating formalisms of lyric poetry. Most of the poems included in Mallarmé's Poésie, that is, uh, his collection of lyric poetry, are in fact Petrarchan sonnets. In Prose pour des Essentes, he goes farther in the art of rhyming than anyone had ever gone, complicating the old French comp concept of rime riche rhymes created by the use of two different words or groups of words in which, which both the stressed syllables and any following syllables are identical, as in lighted and delighted in English. He goes farther in complicating this French concept in ways that have the effect of reversing form and content so that meaning emerges out of the rhymes and the poem becomes an allegory of its own process of becoming. Thus, in the penultimate stanza of prose, I go back to prose, the child resigns her ecstasy already mastering the steps, and Anastasia says she, born for eternal manuscripts, I did the best I, I could, but look at the French. L'enfant abdique son extase et docte déjà par chemin, elle dit le mot Anastase, né pour d'éternel parchemin. Parchemin in the ways and parchemin parchments 
rhyme. That's the, he, he does that about 10 times in that particular poem, and he does that in a number of, of, other, uh, of other poems. What we find also in Ronsara sonnets to Cassandra is this extraordinary musicality of expression and sheer joy of rhyming, this play of syntax that seeds the initiative to the words and to the form of the Petrarchan sonnet itself. It is this that gives free rein to Ronsara's penchant for hyperbole and that allows him to say whatever he wants without regard to prosaic sensibilities. Although a segment of his audience, the Calvinist strain perhaps, probably thought that poetry is the mother of lies, he was fortunate in having readers who intuitively understood that the elegance and eloquence of lyric forms such as the, de the sonnet defend those forms against prosaic intrusions and within certain implicit ideological limits, of course, allow for a freedom of expression not given to other modes of discourse. In poetry such as Ronsard's, lyric forms allow for hyperbole and in turn are, um, and are in turn motivated and mediated by hyperbole. As long as the poet keeps the measure, he can throw as far as he wants and still hit the mark. Autre temps, autre mœurs, the French say. Other times, other customs or values. To Milton in, the seven, in 17th century England, as we see from the note on the verse he attached to Paradise Lost, freedom consisted not in rhyming, but in not rhyming. To some extent, the history of poetry has followed from this direction, with blank verse giving way to, quote, free verse in all of its modes and modalities. Nothing is gained without a loss, however, and free verse is not free to exploit hyperbole in the way Ronsara's sonnets do, because, lacking meter and rhyme, it is insufficiently defended against incursions from the prosaic world, which, as in all times, is, uh, uh, which, uh, as in all times uh, are, uh, is hegemonic. No poet writing today would dare to make the statements and affirmations that Ronsard does in his sonnets. We would be too embarrassed and ashamed. Thank you.